and welcome to this quarterly webinar. Uh, I'm Dr. Lee Sheldon. We're going to have a great time today because we're going to talk about things that you have never seen before. Because um, I've never seen it before. And once you see it, you can say, why didn't I think of that? So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, let me give you an idea as to who brings this to you. So um, <laughs> I'm supposed to do it a little bit different way, but we'll, we'll go with this. All right, so uh, this is brought to you by the Institute for Dental Specialists. That's my organization. That's a mentoring organization for, for specialists and for general dentists to work with specialists. So uh, if you want more information, just uh, contact me. Just reply to this email and go to lee at directorofdentistry.com. We've had some great sponsors who have publicized this, and that's why you're on uh, right now. So from the upper left corner, Stella Life. Um, so life is a homeopathic product, uh, a rinse, which essentially um, um, improves healing tremendously and takes away pain. We've been able to decrease the number of opioids we use in our practice by over 75% simply by having a patient rinse with Stella Life. Um, great product. BioRisons has been the dental implant I've been using for the past oh, almost 15 years. Great company, great company to work with. And um, we're, we're happy to have them as sponsors. Ace Chat, if you have a web website and you're looking at um, making your, ins, your website more interactive, Ace Chat is the place where you go. Imagine having your own chat line where there are people who are manning your website and therefore somebody goes to your website, wants to interact with somebody, and, you know, wants to chat rather than wait to more, to morning to call, tomorrow morning to call. They click on the chat button that's that's imposed on your interposed in your line, and you get a chat service. So, um, great uh, again, a great company. This is a company I've been working with for years. Photona is a new company for us. Uh, they make a laser product that uh, the uh, the Light Walker that has a combination of two different um, uh, wavelengths. You've got erbium lag, you've got ND yag, and uh, the number of things it can do. Um, is just a perk. We're very happy with that. Gilead Dental Marketing is the marketing company that we've used uh, ever since we've been going direct to patient. Um, and uh, they have uh, done a tremendous job both with website, Google AdWords, magazine. Um, great. Um, and all of you know Benko. Benko Dental is also um, the company that we've used for, for many, many years. Their service reps are fantastic. It's still a small company atmosphere. So, um, um, if you're inclined, just take advantage of any of um, any of those um, advertisers help who have helped get you on the line tonight. Well, the real people, the important people, are on the line. The two people you see right now, Dave Matthews uh, participated in a uh, webinar with us uh, just um, a few months ago. He did a webinar with uh, with Frank Spear, got tremendous reviews. Lots of people looked at it, um, and Dave said, you know. I got some other stuff too. And I got this secret weapon. His name is Dave Steiner. He's an endodontist. And we've been doing some neat things together. Dave and Dave have worked in, worked in the same building. They would bounce ideas off of each other. They would create um, uh, new paradigms. Uh, and as I said, there are new paradigms that I've never heard of. This is going to be an exciting lecture. And it's going to bring you a tool to use to help you um, guide um, uh, your patients and perhaps the specialists, the general dentists you work with, to show them a new way in which you can preserve a ridge on uh, a child who's had uh, traumatic injuries. So I take it, uh, I take it away, uh, Dr. Dave Steiner and Dr. Dave Matthews. We'll get to it, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> is that you or is that me? Who's going to snooze? <laughs> so what do we do? There you go. Okay, are we on now? Yeah, well, I can see it perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, kind intro. Uh, I want to intro my uh, good friend, Dave Steiner, who is uh, an endodontist and Dave and I went to UW graduate school together on me and Perio, Dave and Endo. We followed each other to Tacoma and we practiced next door to one another uh, for over 40 years. And it was a real pleasure that I could walk down 
open my door down my hallway and go over to Dave's office and say, what do you do with this, Dave, uh, and get his endo opinion and vice versa. So uh, Dave's a, a stellar clinician, uh, bright guy, good diagnostician, and he's, I don't know anybody who reads radiographs better than Dave Steiner. And uh, we had a wonderful 40-year uh, uh, working together. So, uh, oh, got to get it in the, in our mode so we can advance here, my friend. We do. Yeah. We're having trouble getting the uh, advance button on the PowerPoint, Lee. Okay. Where do we go? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, should we escape and start over? It, it's it's fine with me. What you wanted to do probably would be to go to stop share, okay. and that will that will get you back to our screen where the four where the three of us are together. And let's okay. try the share again. If you want, why don't you just test your PowerPoint uh, right right on your screen right now, not share it, to make sure the PowerPoint itself is working okay. Get that PowerPoint. Okay, now I can see a full screen. I can see the... Yeah, and it's not advancing. Okay. Um, so let's get out of the... Um, uh, let's go back to the view. Let's do the stop share again. Um, and um, go ahead and get your PowerPoint up without sharing it. So you might want to minimize the Zoom view and just make sure your PowerPoint is working correctly. Otherwise, you may want to restart the PowerPoint. So just start your PowerPoint. I mean, I can read that without the screen <clears throat> down below. No, start. It's like we're going to run it off your computer. See, this is what happens when we rehearse it before we start. Everything was working, working perfectly, <laughs> and we jinxed it. So let me tell you while, while we're working out the details, uh, let me tell you a little bit about um, what uh, we're doing here. The Institute of General Specialists, of course, has been around for five years, but we've decided to do these quarterly webinars. And so for those of you who've been on, um, if this is your first time, we have your registration now, and hopefully it's okay with you. We will contact you and we'll let you know about future webinars. We do webinars quarterly, uh, and these are to elevate the profession. It has nothing to do with my particular business, the IDS, it has to do with elevating the profession so that you'll have the opportunity of participating with leaders, thought leaders all over the country who have kindly volunteered their time as Dr. Drs. Matthews and Steiner have so that we have the opportunity of, uh, of gleaning knowledge and being able to share that with our patients. How are you coming, guys? Okay, does it, do you see it there? I don't see, I don't see that because I don't think we're on share yet. Is the is the PowerPoint working off of your computer? Are you doing okay with that? Yeah. All right, good. So now let's you ready to try the share again and see how that works? Well we don't have a, we don't have any share place to do where it's just showing the PowerPoint. Um, okay, did uh, we we minimize the zoom view, so you might want to go to the uh, bottom right side, push the zoom view, which is a uh, uh, it's a it's a blue button with a camera that's facing to the right. Yeah, and we we're not all we've got are images on here. There's no there are no uh, there are no spots to punch. Should I just escape at this point? I think um, first of all, we know you're on Zoom because I can see you and I can hear you. So that part's okay. If uh, maybe if you minimize the PowerPoint, maybe you'll be able to see the Zoom button again. Okay, we're back to Zoom now. And you're okay. ready to share, hit the share button? Yeah, so let's hear the, hit the share button and see how we do. Okay, I think when you hit the share, you probably click the thumbnail that said Zoom rather than the thumbnail that was your PowerPoint. 
So let's do stop share again. You'll see the red button and push stop share. And now let's go to the share button once again. That's the, uh, the green box with the, uh, the green arrow. And now click on your PowerPoint. There we go. And push share again, the blue, blue box says share. And there we go, we're there. Okay, we up okay? Yes, I can see age nine and a couple of people. Okay, there we go, great, okay. Uh, what Dave and I'd like to do this evening is uh, share with you some strategies for dealing with children who have anterior, especially maxillary anterior tooth trauma, and how we can use these strategies to preserve the ridge until they're done with their growth, usually around age 18 to 20, so that they can have a very aesthetic restoration, whether it be an implant or whether it be a bridge. And so we're going to show you some examples of strategies uh, using different modalities so that you can preserve these ridges, whereas a number of times in, a, in a cases, I think that they are overtreated, maybe extractions are done, and when the child is at age where you can restore them, uh, the ridge is damaged and needs a lot of treatment. This is what we would like to avoid uh, when a tooth is avulse, this fellow was uh, age nine. You can see the central incisor was avulse, was replanted. Uh, unfortunately, got ankylosed as most of them do. And there was no treatment plan and there was no monitoring. And so as this youngster grew and the adjacent teeth erupted, the ankylosed tooth, of course, just stays there. And now at age 16, we've got pretty much a damaged ridge when this uh, incisor is extracted. So we would like to share with you some other strategies so that we can avoid this kind of uh, dilemma. This is a youngster, age eight, who uh, had trauma, a lot of fracture of his central incisors, big blunderbuss canals, and I want you to think about these teeth and not so much as the coronal aspect of the tooth, but think about the roots of teeth and what they can do in preserving a ridge. Unfortunately, in situations like this with these really damaged, unrestorable teeth in this youngster, oftentimes they were extracted and then when time came around uh, later on in life, the ridge was, of course, puny and it required a lot of reconstruction to get a tooth or an aesthetic restoration in there. And so in this fellow, we preserved the roots of the teeth. These teeth were not avuls, they were not ankylosed, and so we could keep these teeth. They're not gonna damage the ridge, they're going to as he grows, they're not ankylosed, and we're not going to have the dilemma that we saw in the previous case. And so we followed, Dave followed this patient from age eight till he was done with his growth at age 19 and was able to have both of the central incisors restored with a very adequate ridge without further treatment necessary. Uh, another uh, possible mode of uh, treatment. This was a youngster who at age seven and a half had the central incisor avulsed and the tooth was lost, couldn't find the tooth. And so there are some orthodontic strategies at this age. We treated the, I treated this patient with Dr. Kokich and he allowed these teeth uh, the adjacent teeth to erupt into the site to help develop the ridge. So we're going to discuss this orthodontic possibility at this uh, age where with eruption we can help develop the ridge when a tooth is lost. This was the young lady at age 19 after uh, an implant was placed and then I was able to follow her until age uh, 20 six, uh, so it really was very successful and we'll show the treatment sequence in this patient and how the ridge was preserved with orthodontics. 
Uh, another situation where, uh, to contrast with that first patient, where we have the central incisor in this youngster was avulsed, it was replanted, uh, it ankylosed, and you can see now that it is about in two millimeters of infraposition. This is the time when we want to deal with these teeth. We don't want to let them get further infraposition and start to damage the ridge. And another treatment modality, and in this case was treated with my colleague, uh, Dr. Jim Janikieski, we were able to use tooth autotransplantation. And we'll talk about the sequence and the timing uh, of this. Uh, I think today, autotransplantation is probably our best tooth replacement when we need to replace a tooth. So uh, we will go over these ridge preservation strategies with you for children after anterior tooth trauma. And Sean here uh, is, is a good example. All of these kids started out in the age eight to age 10 range when their problems started. And Sean tried to run up the down staircase. He tried to run up the slippery portion of a slide, did a face plant, and he luxated the two centrals, hard did the palatal. Number eight has a simple coronal fracture, and number nine has a complicated coronal fracture with the pulp exposure. And this eight, eight to 10 year old group is special. They have the highest frequency of oral trauma. The permanent teeth have erupted, but the roots haven't matured. And overarching all of this is that they still have a lot of mid-facial growth to come, which is, makes it a problem in terms of hanging on to the teeth to preserve the ridge. So how do we get these kids from age eight to age 18 with as intact and now heal a ridge as possible. And David and I had a number of these kids, and so we wanted to we wanted to come up with a way to anticipate what their future problems could be so that we could select the best strategy or the best treatment plan based on the kind of injury and then the, the body's healing response. So we made we made a guide. And it's sort of broad and very simple. So you have your trauma, and a tooth can be avulsed, which means out of the socket in your hand on the ground, or not avulsed. And in the not avulsed group are all the rest of the problems, the simple and complicated coronal fractures, concussion, subluxation, lateral luxation, intruded and extruded teeth. And the main difference between those two categories is that an avulsed tooth will ankylose. And in the not avulsed group, most of those do not ankylose, the exception being an intruded tooth, which ankyloses about 24% of the time. An avulsed tooth leads to arrested development of the alveolar ridge associated with it. And that's a real big problem over a long term in a child that's still growing. So some of those articles are advocating don't replant. So if it's avulsed, you have two choices again. You can not replant or you can replant. Uh, the not replant uh, articles the reason they were, were advocating not to replant was because of the large damage ridge, like the first case that David showed in the introduction. And ultimately, if you replant, then we have two choices again. The, the teeth become ankylosed, which is the majority of the teeth, or not ankylosed. And that, that category is getting a little better as we know what to do and when to do it with regards to an avulsed tooth. And the not avulsed teeth then mostly fall into this particular category. So 
what are what are some strategies we can use to preserve the ridge and is there some way we can can get mother nature to do some of the heavy lifting by capturing the the de development of the ridge that would just naturally occur so we'll do the not a volse category here and that's that's Sean. So he's age eight, not ankylosed. And when I see him, I'm going to gather baseline pulpal tests and do periodontal probing. And in this instance, because he has a, a, a pulp exposure, we'll do a spec pulpotomy with MTA material. And then we'll just sit on this tooth do no more treatment other than just the urgent treatment follow the teeth for two to four months watching for signs or symptoms and even if we're not getting vital pulpal responses in that length of time you should see the roots of the tooth get longer or the lumen of the canal get more narrow if there's still vital tissue in those teeth so then you would, you, you've done your pulpotomy as an urgent uh, problem. And then if you see a lesion or the, the patient's having symptoms, then you have two other choices that you can do in terms of treatment. You can do regeneration, which, uh, which you will have the apical portion of the root sometimes get longer and the, and the open foramen narrow or you can do apexification in which you debride the canal, fill it with calcium hydroxide, and over time an apical barrier will form. The problem with both of these techniques is it doesn't make the coronal third of the root of the tooth more strong. And back in 92, uh, Sveck wrote an article that said, I will tell you how often these these immature teeth are going to fracture in the cervical third based on the length of the root of the tooth. And so if a tooth is less than 50% in length, 77% of the time it will fracture. If it's half formed, over 50% of the time it'll fracture. If it's two thirds to three quarters formed, 43% of the time it'll fracture. And if it's formed to link but has a wide open foramen, still almost 30% of those teeth fracture in these, in these immature teeth. The number five group are adult teeth and they fracture in the cervical third just 4% of the time. So returning to Sean, um, this is two months later. He has a periapical radial lucency. I started apexification on the tooth to get a barrier. That it takes between six months and a year of placing calcium hydroxide for the barrier to form. And after a year, I had enough of a barrier to pack the tooth with gutta percha. And then three months after that happened, he came with a fracture in the cervical third. So I saw him uh, on an urgent basis and just basically plucked the, the coronal portion of the tooth out, brought him back a month later to just check how things were doing. And if you look at the radiograph, uh, there, there are no periapical lesions. Um, Check where the distal aspect. Uh, sorry. Your voice is really bad. Yeah, it's okay. okay. So check check on the distal aspect of the root of number nine. It's it's where it it touches ten is about a, a millimeter, a millimeter and three quarters uh, coronal to the CEJ. Just register that. And this is what he looks like then with a the facial view. Remember the level of the soft tissue there in the healing site, and then he has a he has a full ridge from labial to palatal in the number number nine site at this point. 
I've been doing calcium hydroxide on tooth number 11 and, or eight, and uh, within a year, he had fractured that tooth. And I consulted with the, the referring dentist and we batted around taking off the, the crown or extracting the whole tooth and doing a socket graft, or he wanted me to do endo and I thought that would be difficult to control any bleeding or having you know, the sodium hypochlorite leak out through the fracture. So we, we talked about it, we came to no conclusion that, that day and no conclusion is a conclusion. And so I, I talk with him about other patients occasionally and ask about Sean and he said, well, he's doing okay. He's not having any trouble with the tooth. It's a little mobile. It's not bothering him. And that went on for another two years. And finally, I got goosey enough that I was saying, gee, there's got to be enough mobility. Maybe it's affecting the, the coronal portion of the ridge. I think we ought to have the, have the, at least the crown removed at this point. And so at age 15, I got more involved with the patient. And this is what his ridge looks like. The tooth was extracted about uh, five or six weeks previously. And again, register the level of the maxillary soft tissue relative to the lower anteriors. And from an occlusal view, the site in number nine seems totally adequate, full. The site in number eight is a little less full, but, but appears adequate. And radiographically, there are no periapical lesions or problems uh, associated with either of those teeth. Again, note where the, the distal of the root of number eight is relative to seven. It's about the same level as the CJ, and number nine is still a millimeter and three quarters uh, coronal to the CEJ on 10. And I saw the kid uh, intermittently, and now we fast forward to age 19, and he's about ready to have some of his uh, uh, implants placed. And if you look at the ridge, that photograph looks very similar to the one at age 15 at the level of the, of the maxillary soft tissue relative to the lower anteriors. And from an occlusal view, the number nine site seems absolutely full. The, the sharp edge of the root that I didn't polish initially when I took the crown off has eroded its way through the gingiva. Maybe there's a little bit of pressure necrosis because of his, his flipper. And the site in, in the number eight area uh, is a little less full, but, but probably adequate. So root-wise, again, after five years, both of those roots are in the same relative position as they were way back when he was 10 and, and 15. Uh, the distal of number eight is even with the CEJ, the other one is a millimeter and three quarters coronal to the CEJ. So, so what, so what? Well, the so what is what you're not seeing is all of the mid facial growth that has occurred over those years. So the image on the left is a skull of a five and a half year old child. And you can see the distance between crustal bone level and the floor of the nose. And then in the adult skull, you can see the distance is much greater between crustal bone level and the floor mm -hmm. of the nose. So that the alveolar ridge has been developing over that time and the max, maxilla has been growing too. And yet those teeth have stayed basically in the same relative position. So this is what it looks like then at the time of his implants. And you may have an opinion about that. The, 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 buckle plate on number nine looks 
Well, this is, you know, the, the interesting part of this treatment is that Dave has pretty much preserved this fellow's uh, verticality of the ridge and the buccal uh, palatal dimension of the ridge by saving these roots, which remember were not ankylosed roots. And I did not do this treatment here, but we got this picture from the surgeon who did the implants. And you can see that we have, with the roots removed now, that you have uh, a fairly intact ridge. Granted, number eight's a little thin, that could be grafted, but the labial plate on number nine is a lot thicker, but the verticality is there. Uh, implants were placed, and uh, the fellow ended up with a fairly decent uh, restoration. Whereas if these roots were extracted when he was eight years old, he probably would have a, a vertically deficient and most likely uh, buccalingually deficient ridge that would need you know, augmentation pending what the restoration was. So the key points in the not a vulse group are that because it, the teeth are not ankylosed, you should get normal ridge development and normal eruption of the teeth. And if you bank the roots, it appears that they go along for the ride over that time, both preserving the ridge and preserving the height of the ridge uh, over all that time from age 10 or so to age 19. And, you know, for the endodontist, do you obturate it or not? And uh, I just have a case study of one each, and so I don't have a, an answer for that uh, at this point anyway. Now, you, you want to talk? Well, oh, yeah. not, so there's a lot of fiddling uh, during that treatment. And so what, what people are asking me is, well, why bother? Let's just do... Uh, a socket graft. And I looked in the literature trying to find uh, long-term socket grafting and all of the, most all of the literature was talking about six months to a year in adults and they could put in their uh, implants just fine. This is the only, only article I could find that went out from three to, to seven years with their patients. And I don't know if coral granules are worth a toot as a, as a grafting material, but what it showed, they had 48 dental alveolar defects, 17 of which were in the maxillary anterior area. And the two areas, the posterior versus the maxillary anterior behaved differently. And what they did was to remove the tooth, do the socket graft, and then they had to wait some time between three and seven years when the kids were done growing to place, place the implants. And what they found, at least with this material, is that in the maxillary anterior, 82% of the time, it failed to support an implant without an additional bone graft. Whereas in the posterior, both the maxillary and mandibular uh, ridges, not over 90% of the teeth successfully supported an implant with no bone graft. So if there, anybody has an article that has followed uh, socket grafting for a long period of time, I'd put me onto it because I'd like to have that information. Well, and that's the problem with saying that we can graft, we can do a ridge preservation procedure on an eight or a nine year old. Uh, and then when we see them 10 years later, uh, the problem is we don't have any literature that follows these patients with ridge preservation that long. Most of the studies are about a year old and then a restoration is done or an implant is placed. So we don't know what these would look like if a ridge preservation procedure were done and we look at them 10 years later. So our, our conclusion with this, at least with this case, is that if you re retain the immature roots, they should, should be used as an interim treatment. They seem to preserve the ridge through, through the childhood growth and so you have a site that's uh, for a future implant that's, that doesn't require a lot of grafting. And we're not basing uh, this conclusion just on this one case. There, in England, in the pedo department, they had a case series of 53 teeth 
which they um, which they uh, submerged and followed for between one year and seven years, and they had a 90% success rate in that group of teeth. So let's look at the uh, next uh, possibility uh, after trauma in the adolescent and look at the avulse tooth that was not replanted. And this is the patient that uh, lost the central incisor and nobody could find it on the soccer field. And uh, Dr. Vince Kokich, who I worked with for many years, uh, worked with me on this patient who had this right central incisor avulse at seven and a half years, tooth was not found. And so there is a treatment strategy at this age where we could uh, consider orthodontic uh, eruption and letting the adjacent teeth erupt into the edentulocyte to develop the ridge. And this is what Vince decided to do. He just let the teeth erupt. And this was fortunate because the young lady was only seven and a half years old. And we had that possibility of the eruption of the central and the lateral. And then here we are, you can see the lateral incisor, which is now in the central incisor site has erupted. And we know that when it fills that space that it's going to help develop the ridge. And this is what the young lady looked like around age 12 that what you see is the lateral incisor which Vince built up a little bit so it didn't look so goofy and then what he's going to do in her orthodontic treatment he's going to open space for the central incisor and the question is is the space that he created where the lateral occupied previously is that ridge adequate. So let's take a look at uh, what happened as this young lady matured and she got uh, at around age 17. She's uh, through her rapid growth stage. Vince verified that with me with uh, sequential um, uh, tracings. And so the ridge looks, you know, it looks like eh, this is close. And when I open this up, you can see the dilemma. We have the, uh, not only do we have a little bit of thinness of the ridge buccolingually, but we had the incisive canal that I had to be uh, careful to stay out of. And by warping the site a little bit with my spade drills, I was able to get the implant in, but you can see that we have fenestrations and a little dehiscence there. Well, I was able to graft that at the time of the placement and go ahead and get primary closure, uh, use some particulate graft and a resorbable membrane. And then about five months later, uh, was able to do just a very simple uncovering of the fixture. And then the restorative dentist, Dr. McPhee, went ahead and did a provisional. This is day one with the provisional and he was smart enough to leave proper contour and not fill in the black space to give us a chance to let the papilla uh, fill in this area here. And this is seven months later now, still in the provisional stage. Now you can see that my tissue over the labial of the implant and number eight side, it's a little thin. You can see a little bit of redness there. And I'm gonna take care of that, do a little connective tissue graft to him prove that. And so I did uh, uh, a sutureless connective tissue graft on number eight and nine for the young lady. She was really a very nice patient. And uh, then you can see this is before when she was about age 12, before orthodontic treatment. And then we have her now, she's about uh, age 26 now with a very successful implant and restoration and you can see radiographically the bone uh, level on the fixture is doing ex extremely well. So again with orthodontic eruption uh, Vince was able to to 
improved the ridge where the avol's tooth was lost and uh, allowed us uh, to place a fixture and just do some additional uh, augmentation at the time of placement. So the uh, eruption strategy uh, is a great strategy. Unfortunately, it's limited to patients around the age seven to 10 because we still have the eruption potential of the anterior teeth uh, in the site uh, where they've lost a tooth. So it does have an age limitation. Uh, what about autotransplantation? Uh, Dr. Janikowski, who uh, took over my practice, and I practiced together for about six years, and uh, Jim and I went back to Oslo many years ago uh, under the auspices of uh, Bjorn Zacherson, orthodontist, who was a good friend of ours, and uh, we were able to watch the... Um, the, uh, in Oslo, watch them do tooth transplantation. Well, they've been doing tooth transplantation in Norway for over 40 years. They have an amazing amount of data on the success of this procedure. So we took the uh, auto transplantation course, uh, watched them perform. I was near retirement. I told Jim, I said, you know, Jim, this is something that you ought to take over. And uh, Jim, uh, went ahead and actually improved the technique uh, of the auto transplantation. So um, this this patient uh, is one of my favorite ones because he he looks like a Dr. Seuss character. <laughs> he was playing uh, for the for, uh, first base. Uh, the ball hit the web of his net, and then. Uh, hit him in the mouth. And number number nine was fractured and the, um, the incisal of the number eight was also fractured. And you've got to get good radiographs. So a straight on view of number nine, you can see it wasn't just the coronal portion that was fractured, the whole roof was shattered. And I didn't think I could do endodontic treatment in this instance. So ultimately, the, the tooth was extracted. I, I ended up doing endodontic treatment on number eight uh, as we went along. So uh, Dr. Janikowski uh, treated this patient. And uh, today, Jim would do an immediate uh, placement of the autotransplantation. But this was one of the first cases that he treated and so he opted to extract the tooth and the root and let it heal first. Uh, and then he's going to come back later and open the site and do the auto transplantation. Um, the common tooth for auto transplant is the lower second bicuspid because of the root and the shape. And you can see the optimum time to do this is when the root is about two thirds uh, formed. And so again, this is limited to, you want to treatment plan this early because it's limited to that. You got to have the favorable window where you've got the optimum tooth down below to transplant. And this usually is around age 11 or 12. And so what Jim did was he opened the site, he uh, created a, a new socket again and uh, went down below, uh, got the lower second bicuspid, and this is a very, very delicate surgery. You want to, it's like peeling a hard boiled egg out of the shell and not disrupting the membrane whatsoever. And the, the, the kinder you are with the surgery and harvesting this tooth and not damaging the follicle, those are the very successful cases. So you want to have someone who's done a lot of these if they're going to do so Jim harvested the tooth beautifully, got it into the socket, did a little added grafting on the outside, and then simply closed. Now this just looks amazing that you'd put a, a tooth in a socket with a follicle and have some sutures there and not worry about the, the tooth falling out. And so th this is uh, about a week post-op here. And then at four months, 
the nice thing about this when it's done properly is that number one, the pulp lives. Number two, the tooth does not ankylose when the surgery is done very kindly. And therefore the tooth can be orthodontically moved, which is what we did in this case. Uh, it was treated by Dr. Ross Drangskull and Dr. Beth O'Connor here in Tacoma. And Ross, uh, under the guidance of Jim, uh, telling him where exactly we want to move this tooth perfectly to make it look like a central incisor. And you can see incisively here, you think, well, this is going to be a little bit of a problem. It really is not a problem. It's just a little bit broader in the cingulum area than a normal central incisor. Orthodontically moved in the position. And what we're also finding is that these teeth, when they're transplanted and, they, and the follicle is not disrupted whatsoever, the root will continue to grow and mature and lengthen. And this was uh, after orthodontic treatment. Now it's uh, still in a provisional restoration stage, but we have a vital pulp. We have a tooth that is not ankylosed. And at the appropriate time, it will be very simple to uh, restore this tooth. So I really feel that this is sort of the, the, uh, the best tooth replacement we have today, albeit it is limited to that certain age group, but it is unbelievable what it can do when it's handled properly with vitality of pulp and no ankylosis. So with the auto transplantation, again, we're dealing with an age around Dave, can I interrupt you for a second? Where two thirds of the people, yeah. Yeah. Go well, ahead. Going back to that previous case. You want me to go back? Yeah, uh, it's it's the harvesting. How exactly was that harvesting done? I understand you preserve the follicle, but um, are you preserving um, the alveolus um, as well? Um, I mean, am I seeing root? Or am I seeing root with ligament and bone? What am I actually I seeing should, when that tooth uh, is taken out? Uh, number twenty nine is taken out. In for you. What is done, Lee, is that the the lower area is flapped. The buccal plate is carefully removed, uh, and then the follicle and the tooth are very carefully uh, teased out of there, just like I'm mentioning teasing a hard-boiled egg out of a out of a sock out of an eggshell, and so it's teased out of there, and the then the entire follicle and the tooth and the root are then transplanted into the site that was prepared up above. Okay, so when you say the buckle plate is removed that you're taking some brush strokes with some kind of a burr to remove the buckle plate in order to be able to move that tooth labially in order to get it out? To to harvest it atraumatically, that's what has to be done, yeah. Okay. Um just out of curiosity, what once you've done that, what happens to the 29 site? What what do you do with that later on? Okay, so then then your options are and what the, what they do in in Europe is that they, they close the space orthodontically. Okay. Thank you. So good question. Uh, I've got a very lengthy series on what that looks like and I thought for time I would put it in there, but that's a great question. Um, so the nice thing about this, when the surgery is done, uh, and again, there are very few people who have done this. It's like, you know, when you're having your knee replaced or your hip replaced, you ask the surgeon, how many of these a week do you do? And how long have you been doing it? You don't want somebody who said, yeah, I took that course on the weekend. This is something that has to be extremely fastidiously done so you do not damage the follicle. Because if you damage the follicle, that's where you get ankylosis and that's where you get non-vitality. So if done properly, these do not ankylose. Uh, the alveolar process will continue to develop because we have PDL and you can move the tooth orthodontically. And the success of both pulpally, Dave, would you say is 90% success of maintaining vitality and also in avoiding ankylosis when done properly. 
So now we're going to another category. The tooth was avulsed, replanted, and it didn't ankylose. And these teeth, they don't get off scot-free. Oftentimes they, they need uh, uh, endodontic treatment or they always need endodontic treatment. Sometimes they'll have uh, uh, inflammatory resorption that, that needs to be treated. But our success rate with this is doing better because we're a little bit more knowledgeable about what's going on. And so I, I won't show an example, but just, 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 I'll just tell you in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, what if you, if, what will prevent ankylosis and how you should go about it. So if you replant a tooth in less than five minutes, almost none of them ankylose. If you, replant them at an hour's time or longer, almost all of them ankylose. And these studies were done with dry time, which means they didn't put the teeth in any, any solution at all. So all of these are dry time. And the magic time where there's an exponential breakdown of the, of the PDL cells is between 15 and 20 minutes. So if you can get the tooth replanted in uh, less time than that, then 70 to 80% of the time, those teeth don't ankylose. Now you should always, you should always put them in a solution like Hank's balanced salt solution, or even just milk. And then if you can have some ice to pack around the solutions to, to slow the deterioration, that seems to help a little bit. But what we don't have, and we need the Scandinavians to do a big hospital study of this, we don't know more precisely, it absolutely helps, but how much does it help? Is it 10% better? Is it 40% better? We don't know that at this point. We just don't have the data to, to, to uh, make better comments about it. And then the final category, the tooth is avulsed, you replant it, and it becomes ankylosed. And this category is kind of the most intriguing, interesting, at least to me, um, because an ankylosed tooth is going to cause arrested development of the alveolar ridge associated with it. These 8 to 10 to 12-year-old kids have a lot of growth to come. So... What is it that we can do to mitigate the formation of a large defect? And when do you do the treatment? And equally as important is what are realistic expectations? Because some of the, some of the articles that talk about the treatment have this mile high expectations of what can be done. So I want to spend just a few minutes um, uh, presenting some basic uh, background information. Uh, so we all start at the same point in terms of what we what we are thinking about when we're doing this uh, in terms of the treatment of uh, of an ankylosed uh, tooth. And there are two main characteristics associated with ankylosis. One is replacement resorption. So the root of the tooth is resorbed and replaced by bone. And that's a good characteristic that we can turn to our advantage. The other characteristic is that it, the arrested development of the alveolar ridge associated with an ankylosed tooth. And that in a growing child can lead to a great, great huge defect that, that can't be overcome on. So replacement resorption or ankylosis. Ankylosis occurs when the PDL necrosis and there's a bony union between the root of the tooth and the alveolus. And once that occurs, we have no way of stopping it or reversing it. And it's characterized by the resorption of the root of the tooth and its replacement by bone. And so number eight has been avulsed, it's ankylosed. If you follow the mesial PDL, it looks intact, and there's no question where tooth ends and alveolar bone begins. But after a year's time, if you try to follow the mesial PDL 
it becomes indistinct and there's a blending of the apical portion of the root of the tooth and the alveolar bone. And then after five years, most all of the root has been resorbed and replaced by bone. And if you'll notice the incisal edge, it's a little bit in the infraocclusion. So what has happened is the adjacent teeth and the adjacent alveolar ridge have, have grown or the teeth have erupted, whereas that tooth has not changed its location when it, when it uh, became ankylosed. Now let me show you a world-class problem with the arrested ridge development. This is Jimmy. Jimmy looks like any other 16-year-old kid until he smiles, and then he appears to be missing his left maxillary central incisor. But on closer inspection, you'll see he's missing that tooth. It's just in severe infraocclusion. And it isn't that that tooth has submerged, it's that the adjacent alveolar ridges and the adjacent teeth have erupted. So, so what's the problem? The problem as, as I see it is the arrested ridge development associated with, um, with, the, uh, with an ankylosed tooth coupled with the continuing facial growth of a child. And so how do we know how large a defect is going to develop? How do we know when to intervene? Since the extent of the defect is, is, uh, it is part of how much facial growth after ankylosis, it depends on that. And the majority of that growth comes during an adolescent growth spurt. We want to know where the child is relative to their adolescent growth spurt. And the way to do that is just go to the literature and people have measured the kids uh, skeletally and, and then at the, seeing the spikes of growth uh, at, at the ages that that happens. And for girls, it happens at 10 and a half and goes through 13. And at age, uh, around that age, uh, young women start their period. And when they start their period, they're about 80% done with their skeletal growth, their, their height. Boys, of course, start later at age 12 and a half, go through 15. And they have a long run out of, uh, of when they're still growing to 18 to 20, 20 years old. If you want to refine these median ages, the easy thing to do is just have the parents six months ahead of those that of 10 and a half or 12 and a half for the boys, 10 and a half for the girls, have them start recording their height, just back them up to the door jam and measure them. And they'll be going along at no much, hardly any change, uh, an eighth of an, an inch. And then all of a sudden it's a quarter of an inch, three eighths of an inch, and you know then you're at the start of adolescent rapid growth. Now this, this next graph, I, I like for me, so I understand it better. It's a graph showing the amount of skeletal growth of a patient each and every year. It's not a cumulative graph. And what was done, uh, a naturalist biologist in the 1800s measured his son when he was born and then measured him on his birthday from birth to age uh, 18, and then connected the dots. So when he was born, he was nine inches in length. The next year, he grew seven and a half inches. The second year, he grew uh, three and a half inches. And then from age three on, clear almost to his adolescent, start of his adolescent growth spurt, he was growing two and a half inches uh, roughly on, on either side of that. And then at his, you can see how the, the growth in inches during the spike of his growth is going on. And at the height of it, he was, he was 
uh, had grown five inches that year. So there's a lot of a lot of skeletal growth, and there's a correlation between the amount of skeletal growth and the mid facial growth. It's not a one to one sort of ratio. Of one inch equals one millimeter, but the more they grow, the more the defect is going to be. And if you put use this as a template because it's pretty much the way the kids, other kids uh, may uh, start their rapid growth a little earlier or a little later, but it's, it's, good, it's a good uh, representation of what's going to happen. So this is Jimmy's tooth at age eight. The tooth was replanted, it's a little bit it was extruded because they couldn't seed it all the way in, in the socket. And then he goes until for three years till just before his adolescent rapid growth. And there's been some inferclusion of the tooth because uh, the, he's growing a little bit each year and his uh, mid face is developing. And this is about the optimum time, two to three inches in infraclusion that you want to intervene. Did I? Oh, millimeters. I, millimeters, did I say <laughs> inches? Oh yeah, well sorry. Yes, millimeters in infraclusion. So here he is at the start of adolescent rapid growth. Then from 11 to 14, now the tooth is six millimeters in infraclusion. And then from 14 to 16, he's still growing, and the tooth is nine millimeters in intraocclusion. And we thought we would try to move the tooth, have it luxated with a band, and see if we could pull it down. And within two weeks, it re ankylosed, and it was luxated the second time and really has a lot of force applied to it and it re in about four days. So the tooth was removed and you can see the facial view of the, of the soft tissue and an occlusal view certainly looks deficient and it really shows up on the radiograph. You can see the shadow of the soft tissue and then the amount of the level of the bone and most of that bone is missing on the labial aspect of the, of the, of the ridge. So in 84, uh, Momgren and Sveck wrote an article uh, about surgical treatment of ankylosed teeth and what they were describing is to remove the crown of the tooth leave the root in place to undergo replacement resorption. And they measured to see how much, uh, what happened to the ridge. And they started with 21 teeth. Some of the youngest uh, um, kids, they, they um, dropped out because the, the, they were using stints to take the radiographs at exactly the same angle for each time that they were doing it. And there was too much change in eruption of teeth for those kids to, to be followed. But the ones they did follow, what they found was that bone moved, they, was deposited coronally between two tenths and one millimeter. So a modest amount of vertical addition of bone. Three of the cases, there was no movement, but they didn't lose any. And in three cases, then the boo, they lost bone apically between three tenths of a millimeter and 1.3 millimeters. So this, this is what is known now as the coronation. And, and it's, it's, it's really a good idea. The problem is it's sometimes hyped in some of the case reports and the, the, the movement coronally, at least in the original article, is, is modest. So here's a, here's a tooth that is similar to uh, Jimmy and it was avulsed, ankylosed, age nine. They did the surgery, decoronated at age 15. And you can see that that's just way too late. The big ridge 
damage has already been done. It, it, it is no better than just extracting the tooth. You have probably a knife, knife edge ridge and a large labial defect. So we think that the timing uh, is important when you do decoronation. So uh, we think you should decoronate near the start of adolescent rapid growth or when the tooth is about two to three millimeters in infraclusion relative to the contralateral tooth. And 20 years after their first article, Momgren and, and her husband wrote an article with, with a hypothesis of why the bone is deposited. And essentially what they're saying, after the crown is removed, the socket heals over, there's periosteum over the decoronated root. That periosteum is attached to the adjacent uh, teeth and, and uh, ridge. And then as those teeth erupt and those ridges develop, they put traction on the, uh, the periosteum over the decoronated root, and then bone is laid down uh, apically to the, to the, or, no, well, it, apically to the, to the periosteum and, and above the decoronated root. And so if you do it, if you decoronate, maybe you'll have more time for there to be traction uh, to, to move that. And, and I'll show you as best I can with an illustration. So this is the ankylosed tooth at age eight, but at age eight, all the rest of the teeth were between the yellow lines. They were at the same level as that tooth. And then over with, uh, with Jimmy from age eight to age 12, when he, when he starts his rapid growth, those teeth have erupted a little bit the tooth still is in position in two or two to three millimeters in infraocclusion. So now it's time to decoronate the tooth. And once the tooth, uh, the crown of the tooth is removed, then the periosteum heals over the decoronated root and attached to the periosteum adjacent to it. And as the teeth then continue to erupt and the ridge continues to develop, traction is put on the, the um, periosteum and you sort of have a periosteal sling as this is, is pulled coronally and then bone is deposited underneath, uh, underneath the periosteum. So that's the hypothesis that, uh, that they've offered and, and the peri some of the Periodontal uh, portions of the periodontal ligament are also involved in this. So, just to recap, that replacement resorption of the root of the tooth is a goodness. Arrested ridge, uh, ridge development is the problem we're trying to deal with. We think you should remove the crown near the start of rapid growth or roughly two and a half millimeters in infraocclusion and leave the crown if rapid growth is, is complete. And, and with the young women, it's easier to tell because uh, of they've started their period you, and they're not growing very much. You can just let the tooth undergo replacement resorption and bond and incisal an edge until the process is completed. So this is, this is Bobby. Bobby was age nine when his tooth was avulsed and it was ankylosed. The orthodontist helped replant the tooth and uh, splinted it. I started endodontic treatment on number eight. And a month later, uh, tooth number nine is showing a periapical lesion. So I started treatment on it and then completed the treatment. And then I think I'm marrying these people back to the general dentist, but I, if you're the specialist helping them, you've got to hawk them a lot more closely than I did in, in the early days. So he comes back at age 14, the tooth is in infraclusion, his smile's looking bad, he wants to know what can be done. And this is the facial view. The, the tooth is actually in about the right position to, to be thinking about decoronating it. 
But the problem, at least for me at this point, is because I haven't been following it closely, most of the root of the tooth has been resorbed. And I need to remove that gutta percha while there's tooth structure around it. Yeah. So this is, is not an optimum time to be trying to take the gutta percha out of there. And I talked to Matthews about it. and. He thought that probably at the time of implant placement, we could uh, remove the gutta percha with uh, fairly straightforwardly. So the orthodontist is still messing around with things. I'm telling him, "Look, you're burning daylights. I want to, I want to decoronate this as soon as we can." And at this stage, we decoronate the tooth and. And um, Momgren said that all you need to do is just turn a flap, remove all of the enamel portion of the, of the crown of the tooth, and stay away from the, the uh, alveolar crest, which is what we're doing in the surgery. And then this is what it looks like. Uh, the cement that you see there is a, a barrier between the gutta percha and the chamber, so if there is any leakage through uh, uh, the crown of the tooth, uh, the gutta percha, at least when we're doing uh, the endo, is is protected. But you can see the residual tooth structure. There's a horseshoe of from mesial labial to distal of the residual root. Most of the palatal had been resorbed and sutured, and then this is what it looks like radiographically. There's no bone particularly coronal to the level of the remaining root that you can see the, the, the portions of it, the spicules of root on the mesial and distal and it runs uh, across the labial. So I'm a year later, uh, was thinking of getting uh, good pictures, but I couldn't get an occlusal view uh, easily. But if you look at the apex of number eight, you'll see a highlight where the flash is. And there is a little bony, like an exostosis in that particular area when you palpate it. Radiographically, you can see the bone that has been deposited coronal to the spicules of the root here. So that's a goodness. We're glad to have it. And then at age 16, this is a facial, facial view of the soft tissue. This is what it looks like occlusally. And again, you can see that that exostosis feeling thing is the resorption of the root and its replacement by bone. So there's a large volume of, of bone down at that level where the root is. And radiographically, the spicules are undergoing replacement resorption slowly. The, the bone doesn't seem to have come more coronally when I look at it proximally. And then fast forward to age 19, and this is what the, the sites look like at that, at that age. So we've got pretty good bone. Maybe it's a little apical to where it would be ideal, but we, we've got bone that has filled in where the root used to be. And the spicules of tooth have all been resorbed. The bone there in over the, over the gutta percha is more mature looking. It's not more coronal. It kind of looks like it without the markers to compare to, but I don't think it's changed level at all. So this is what it looks like uh, at, at age nine when I've completed the, the, the treatment. Age 14, that's when it was decoronated. This is the coronal bone present. That's the same as it was in the first year. And then here is at age 19 when it's getting closer to time when he can and have his uh, restorative treatment. But if you look at the apex of number seven relative to the gutta percha in the first, in the first frame, 
and then look at it at the decoronation time, that apex is halfway down the gutta percha level at that point. And so in our mind's eye, we were concerned about that in terms of um, following uh, um, Malmgren's hypothesis of the, the adjacent uh, periosteum uh, being traction being placed on it and, and forming the bone because of, of the eruption of the teeth. It looks like I've missed most of the eruption. We've got some bone. The question is, where is it and, and is it uh, any good? So this is uh, Bobby now at about age 19, Dave. Yeah. And uh, the concern that I had was that, yes, the apical third or maybe the apical half, you could see that big beacon of bone sticking out there where the uh, where we uh, decoronated and the root had resorbed and formed bone. But the question was in that coronal third, what was the width of the bone buccalingually? And we know vertically, it looks fantastic on the radiograph that Dave showed you, the sequential growth of bone vertically, but how wide is it buccal palatally? And so I thought, you know, this is, uh, I didn't think that it was going to be wide enough and it was going to need some further grafting. So this is what it looked like closely here, you know, not too bad, but it, it looks like it's going to be too narrow to consider doing an implant without further augmentation anyway, or without grafting first uh, and then doing an implant later. So we had a, a scan done and you can see that I was shocked that the coronal third of that ridge was nice and husky from a labial to palatal aspect. I was really shocked. And you can see that it looks like there's a rather large fenestration into the gutta percha at the apical third but when we look surgically, you'll see there was just a little peekaboo hole there. So scans are not always perfectly accurate when you're looking at this. It looks like we have a big void there on the labial. But when we look from a surgical point of view now, he, Bobby's at age 20. We were sure that he was substantially done with his growth. And so we felt this uh, timing now to go ahead and do the implant. Uh, was appropriate timing. You, of course, know that you don't want an implant in a child who's still growing because that's like putting a, that's like the ankylose tooth problem that we showed previously. So uh, here he is about age 20. I uh, went ahead and I was absolutely shocked. And when you look at the occlusal view, uh, how wide that ridge was right at the crest, I could not believe my eyes. I still don't know uh, why this happened. Um, Dave and I have reviewed all of the literature on decoronation, and I've seen a number of cases published, and they all look pretty good in the apical third, but in the coronal third or coronal half, the ridge buckle lingually is way too narrow to implant. And so um, this, this was a surprise. But, and notice where the, the proximal bone is on uh, seven and nine. It's just, it's really in a sweet position for, for doing your implant and having your papilla. And the other thing that was uh, interesting was you can see just that tiny little fenestration uh, in the in the ridge uh, where the gutta perch is, whereas if you look at the scan, it looks like there's going to be a huge fenestration. So that's what we see surgically, the little tiny fenestration uh, where the gutta percha was. And I was able to uh, hit a bullseye uh, in the drilling, and we were able to get the gutta perch out of there without any problem. Of course, had a very nice ridge. Uh, you know, this is one I tell my students, this is a I call them the BFC, that's the blindfold case. The ridge is so good you can do it with a blindfold on. And so it was a really a very surprising, uh, but, a, but a nice uh, outcome, the fact that we had such good bone in the coronal aspect. Fixtures place, you can see there's a small little fenestration apically. Uh, did a little uh, particulate grafting 
over that area, which probably wasn't even necessary. Uh, implants placed, uh, grafted uh, coronally advanced the tissue and got primary closure. Uh, I placed a little two millimeter healing abutment on the implant and get primary closure over that so that when we uncover this, it's just a simple little punch uncovering and remove the two millimeter healing abutment, put a little taller abutment on. So good closure. And then uh, placement of a provisional restoration and uh, this, or have not been able to follow up on this fellow, but this is what, about a four month post-op uh, on the uh, restoration at this point in time. So uh, again, uh, decoronation, uh, but I think this one, we got a little lucky, wouldn't you say, Dave? Yeah, we don't know exactly why it turned out the way it did. It didn't follow the, the working hypothesis very well. So in the decoronation, uh, the timing is critical for the best preservation. As Dave showed you, that you want to do this, you want to follow, you want to get them before they get into the rapid growth stage because at that point we have the great eruption potential of the adjacent teeth which in turn can have the periosteal sling do the pulling of the bone vertically and that is the optimum time. We don't know what happens in multiple adjacent missing teeth sites and the, uh, my suspicion is that this is good in a one tooth site but when you have two or more adjacent missing teeth, I think that the perios, periosteal sling aspect, I think is, I would think would be diminished a little yes, bit. And so. so for the one tooth side is probably your optimum uh, response. You wanna decoronate at the start of rapid growth, and that is usually when we have about a two to three millimeter infra position of the incisal edge of the ankylosed tooth. Again, these have got to really be monitored so you don't end up with our case where we showed you the tooth is up under the guy's nose. And our research and, and doing the literature search is that most of these did not completely eliminate the ridge defect. Yes, they were a little better, but um, they did not totally eliminate the defect so that you had an unbelievable ridge like we had in this case, kind of an outlier, I think. Uh, socket grafting, yes, we can do ridge preservation, but ridge preservation, again, remember, does not, uh, we don't gain vertical height when we do that. So our treatment options for the ridge preservation, uh, one, let's look at the not a volst case. Remember, if it's not a volst, we can submerge the root. We can do root burial or you can do auto transplantation. In the case where the tooth becomes, uh, is avulsed, we can do auto transplantation. You can do orthodontic ridge development as we showed, letting adjacent teeth erupt to develop the ridge. And you can consider decoronation. Hey. Tout our article. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we we have written up the the, the couple of the uh, the cases in a case report that's uh, that is in press now with uh, compendium. So uh, it'll be out sometime, and and we don't show all of the different uh, strategies, but at least a couple of them. So thank you very much. Yeah, that was a good presentation. I like that. If you have, there are any questions, there's a Q&A box uh, somewhere in your screen. Uh, just type in a question. I already got an accolade in the middle. It was a good attaboy for both of you. This is fast, uh, fascinating information. Um, how widely is this disseminated? In other words, if we're talking with our local specialists, um, has this, and I'm, I'm talking as a periodontist, uh, Dr. Steiner, um, how well is some of your material disseminated among endodontists? Oh, well, it's in the Seattle area around the, you know, the, the, the UW, the, all those grad students know it because of me. I don't, we've, we've given this lecture to Carl Reeder's group and 
but in general, I don't know that that's out in the ether very far. I really think, Lee, my experience has been, except uh, in the Northwest where we do have our, our interdisciplinary seminar and it's part of the graduate periodontal uh, cross and orthodontic curriculum that I feel trauma is poorly managed. It, there's not much understood about trauma and I think that there's a lot of over treatment and trauma cases and a lot not a lot of understanding yeah. i don't know how it is in the rest of the country but i i know in our area we because dave and i and frank and vince have uh, talked a lot about it okay um in the ankylos case um where you're talking about the evolved uh, tooth that was um re-implanted too late uh and you do your coron coronectomy and you're getting that uh, coronal migration. I understand this is a result of vertical uh, growth and development of, of the entire maxilla. Is there a limit or w when you're grinding away the tooth, to, to, to make it blunt, um, what are you looking for or when do you stop? Oh, well, I mean, you're, you're trying to outline the enamel, the, around the enamel of the tooth and I would, I would not keep going apically. I, once you get the, all the enamel portion of the tooth removed, you're done. Okay. All right. And you know, the, what, what, you know, the case that Dave had, the tooth was chewed up significantly. But if you read the SVEC article, and correct me, Dave, on this, I, the, the standard approach they used was that they, they excise the crown of the tooth, the enamel part, and they burr the root, maybe a millimeter subcrestal, and then they hog out the entire canal and take out, if there's gutta perch in there, they get it all out and they hog out the canal to minimize the width of the, the, what, the residual root. They want that, that to resorb more quickly. So if they feel if they hog out the canal really a lot and really thin out the, the lumen between the canal and the outside of the root, that this is gonna resorb more quickly. Okay, that's interesting information. Uh, one question they, we have: They log it out, and they let they just let blood flow into there, and they and they don't even they they don't even worry about the primary closure. I don't think, do they, Dave? Just like I get it, they're not trying to yeah. advance the blast. Yeah, so essentially, you're acting. I mean, the osteoclasts are are working; they're acting as dentinoclasts, if you will, and yeah, uh, it's just a a turnover of of dentin and and, and bone. Um, Colin Richmond writes, please comment on your clinical experience relative to a retained, usually ankylosed mandibular deciduous molar associated with a congenitally missing mandibular bicuspid. Boy, Colin, you got something really specific here. Um, can, you, can, can you give me an idea on that? What, that, that, well, that, that's, the, that's the pedodontist in our study clubs uh, who needs to answer that. Well, I, I, you know, you know um, Ward Smalley, who's a prosthodontist here in Seattle, Ward is uh, ortho-trained and prost-trained, and uh, Ward has a, a series of lower primary ankylosed molars that he decoronated. And I keep wanting him to show me this presentation. I haven't seen it yet, but he says that it's, you can decoronate a lower ankylose primary molar and uh, uh, end up with a better ridge. I haven't seen it yet. So the question though that Colin asked, um, we, when you have an ankylose primary molar, you wanna do the same as you do in the maxillary anterior region. You don't want to let it get infraposition more than a few millimeters before you pull the plug on it, because if you do, it's going to continue to destroy the ridge. And so you have to pull the plug on it. And in the ankylosed one now, I'm saying you got to pull the plug on it before it destroys the ridge. And you can use uh, orthodontic. Uh, you, you can plan to close the space later, but the point is that these are often left too long and then you destroy the ridge and then you've got a puny ridge and a, and a big verticality defect there. 
Uh, did, did, did that answer his question? It kind of does, Colin. Just let me know if that answers your question. Let me comment on that. You know, taking out those teeth is a, a pain in the neck. You never know whether you've got the tooth completely out. Um, yeah. So I think it Colin- It may not matter. Yeah. Was that? And it may not matter if you leave, if you leave, if it's ankylosed and you leave those roots in there, and I have done that, and when you look at it years later, a lot of times the root has uh, resorbed and become bone. Okay, so essentially it, it, you're, you're treating the mandibular uh, bicuspid, I mean the, the mandibular molar, uh, primary molar, the same way you treated that upper, uh, upper incisor. You're treating it the same way, um, and you expect it to get, get the same result, which would make sense. And Colin, does, Colin said a, it does answer his question. I think you'll get a decent uh, vertical result, but again, the question is, what's gonna, what's it gonna look like buccolingually? And in my experience, they all are a little deficient for uh, what I would say if you're gonna do an implant and they need further augmentation, either at placement or prior. Okay, Colin's comment is, one should not take out the roots, just decoronate. Um, I mean, that's essentially the rule we're looking at right now. Decoronate, yeah, let the I, body let the body take care of uh, as long as the enamel's out of the way, the body will I, take I care of the turnover that, itself. Yeah, I, I would agree with them. I think that would be the best treatment is to decoronate it. I, but I haven't followed them long enough to see what happens, but it's got to be better than completely extracting the ankylos tooth. Yeah, it's good stuff. These guys want to come back. What do you think? Uh, I want you back. So. Uh, well, um, you know, Dave and I got, you know, we're, we're, uh, we got tons of stuff. We've been working <laughs> together for 40 years. He's edumacated me uh, considerably and making me a better periodontist. So uh, we've got, uh, I keep telling, I got a list of 10 articles that we're supposed to write before we die. Uh, we, we've only gotten to number one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Dave Steiner, Dave Matthews, uh, just tremendous material. Um, Thanks, uh, thanks uh, for letting us know. Those of you who have come on late, um, we have recorded this, and I will send it out to the list. Uh, those who are on the IDS list will get it automatically. If you're not on the IDS list, just write to me, Lee at DirectorOfDentistry.com, Lee, L-E-E at DirectorOfDentistry.com. I'll get you on the IDS list, which will get you on uh, the invitation list for these quarterly seminars that we're doing. Again, guys, thank you for taking the time to prepare this. Just a tremendous, uh, tremendous material and ter tremendous preparation uh, on your part. So uh, thanks for spending the time doing this. Thanks thank for, you. Thanks, thanks for, for getting, the invite. Yeah, thanks for getting us hooked up, Lee. Terrific. And we'll see you again. Our next webinar, we haven't established a date yet, um, but it'll be sometime in late March, early April, and uh, we'll give you sufficient time to get, get on. Again, thanks, our guests. Thanks for all of you for attending. Good night.